So the purpose that I have in this uh, conversation is really to lay out some of the main aspects of Edmund Burke's thought as they relate to his writing The Reflections in 1790 in response to uh, the events of the French Revolution. And I thought I'd start just by uh, asking the question to set the scene, as it were, who now reads Reflections on the Revolution in France? Who ever read it through? Well, I'm not sure about the, the latter point. It is a, it's a really uh, uh, weighty tome. But the work is still, I'm pleased to say, assigned almost by default as the contribution of this great Irish-born politician, Edmund Burke, to the tradition of modern conservatism. Sadly, it is probably the only work by Burke that many students and general readers will encounter. Uh, and that has certain difficulties, as I'll try to explain over the course of this talk. So the next appropriate question, I think, to ask is why read the reflections in particular? Well, I've already said it's become something of, a, uh, of an icon, as it were, of uh, modern conservatism. But as part of intellectual history, the book holds a prime place in the resistance to the ideas of the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century. And though I disagree with uh, this point, it is said to support that concept of a counter-enlightenment uh, within Western civilization, the influence that that had in the 19th century and later. As a work of rhetoric, of course, it stands almost on its own as a piece of sustained, uh, almost sublime eloquence. But as a contribution to political theory, well, the language of reflections appears increasingly remote, arcane, and perhaps in our times, offensive. Arguments proposing religion, natural law, private property, and aristocracy as proper foundations of a virtuous civil society, and of the societal value of prejudice, custom, chivalry, manners, and the gentleman would seem to offer little to the armory of modern political debate. Suggesting then a political reason for reading reflections alongside the historical and the literary is a tricky assignment. But I'm going to attempt to approach some kind of answer. And I'm going to start 30 years before the outbreak of the French Revolution with a quotation that can be found in Burke's private notebook compiled before he entered politics himself. The notebook was uh, published about uh, 70 years ago now. Um, it's one of a series of notebooks that were found in Edmund Burke's uh, archives and now in uh, Sheffield, the, uh, the, the, the council uh, archives in Sheffield. Um, we're pretty certain that the references that I make to uh, the notebook in this talk come from Edmund Burke himself, uh, partly uh, through attribution in the original manuscript and the uh, the handwriting, which would seem to almost certainly to be Edmund Burke's own. So what's this quotation? Well, um, 
it appears uh, in a little uh, section within uh, the notebook itself that has this title written in by Edmund Burke. Several scattered hints concerning philosophy and learning collected here from my papers. And this is what he says. A man who considers his nature rightly will be diffident of any reasonings that carry him out of the ordinary roads of life. There is some general principle operating to produce customs that is a more sure guide than our theories. They are followed indeed often on odd motives, but that does not make them customs less reasonable or useful. Now, to return to reflections on the revolution in France, who did Burke appear to see as his main antagonist, as it were, in the unfolding of the revolution? Well, first, there was the British Revolution Society, uh, a gathering, an organisation of what one might call, I suppose, political theologians or spiritual doctors of politics. These figures, these uh, intellectuals, these uh, academics and uh, clerics promoted close associations with the revolutionaries in France in the hope that their achievements in French affairs would provide perhaps an incentive for the British to further reforms that the society believed had been fought for in the glorious revolution of 1688. This is the time when uh, the final Catholic King James II was overthrown from the uh, throne of um, England and Scotland. Um, and resulted in the uh, Bill of Rights uh, passed by uh, Parliament um, and bringing in the uh, reign of William of Orange, William III and Mary. And the way in which uh, Burke presents these um, claims, as it were, of the Revolution Society, is, is, is they would almost trump the new United States for its uh, democratic spirit, for its emphasis upon the sovereignty of, uh, of the people um, uh, over the constitution and uh, constitutional settlements. And Burke spends uh, quite a lot of the um, first part of Reflections really defending uh, the uh, constitutional settlement in England as it emerged uh, in England, Scotland, as it emerged from uh, the Glorious Revolution, defending the established church, monarchy, uh, aristocracy and democracy. The uh, second group, shall we say, of antagonists uh, were the French men of letters, uh, professionals and intellectuals in France, who seem to have obtained power through an unholy compound of abstract theories and an association with the moneyed interest in French society. And Burke spends some of the uh, latter part of uh, reflections um, questioning uh, the uh, constitutional, financial and military future of France, as it were, under, under their hands. Now, each of these classes, the Revolution Society, the, 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 the men of letters in France, approached political activity through uh, a route that Burke famously termed uh, metaphysical abstraction. And I want to spend a moment um, going back to the notebook, actually, to, to try and define a little further what Burke kind of meant by that 
term. And indeed, why we should care uh, or be interested about it nowadays. Well, in the same section uh, where I took that quotation just a, a little bit uh, ago, um, you can find uh, Burke interjects into that section story about uh, the Greek cynic uh, Diogenes. It's a uh, a story, probably uh, many of you will uh, have heard of it, uh, it comes out of uh, Cicero's Tusculan Disputations. And it's about the time when uh, Diogenes is being asked uh, by his friends uh, what they should do with his body. And he says, um, basically, well, just chuck it in the fields. Uh, and uh, one of the friends responds that, uh, you know, well, this wouldn't be a very good idea because the wild animals may come and, uh, and, and pick at it and uh, um, uh, 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 d destroy, destroy it. Uh, and uh, Diogenes says, well, uh, then you can always uh, take a staff and uh, put it in the ground beside me. And again, one of the friends says, well, that's not going to be much good, is it? Because you'll be dead by then, so you won't be able to fend off the uh, animals. And, uh, uh, and Diogenes says, well, uh, yes, and because I'm dead, I won't feel uh, their teeth or their claws. Well, the conclusion Burke draws from this story uh, is that while the cynic's turn, if you like, of argument is good, it's a smart and uh, quite marvellous riposte to uh, his friends, the philosophy behind it has no substance. And Burke develops this actually, uh, I think, very interestingly by talking about um, uh, funerals, funerary rites. Um, uh, and says, you know, there, there may seem to be no very clear point about some of the rites that we um, uh, indulge in after a person's death, but they do have a purpose, they do have a significance if one thinks about it, um, uh, a significance in various different ways. In other words, um, as I take Burke's meaning, there is sort of nothing of social use to be drawn from Diogenes's line of thought. Uh, you know, if you leave uh, dead bodies all over the fields and so on and so forth, then it's not going to be of much uh, use to anyone. And therefore, it makes much more rational sense, really, to uh, pursue the sorts of customs that we have traditionally associated uh, with, uh, with the dead and how to, to treat the dead. Um, and in this sense, I understand Burke to be um, arguing that the cynic's problem here is really to have separated two aspects of life that Burke regards as inextricable. One is living according to nature, and of course the, 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 the cynic argument was really that this is what they were doing, sort of rationally living according to nature. But the other uh, factor is living according to the artifices of nature, that is to customs, or what we might term tradition more broadly in society, which is effectively the reason of social man working on instinct and opinion over many generations to strengthen the bonds of society for all humans. You may find Cicero actually takes a similar line against the cynics in his book on duties. Now if we return to reflections, we see Burke arguing that the famous Genevan man of letters, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, applied moral lessons in a similar way as Diogenes. 
in his case perhaps to catch the audience through marvelous observations on the disorders between nature and civilization. And this was a reflection that um, Burke had originally um, developed back in the uh, 1760s, the early 1760s, um, before he became a politician. So it's a response to Rousseau that is not without um, appreciation and respect, but it's not one that was suddenly sort of trumped up uh, as a way of trying to explain what was going on in France uh, at the time. Burke was later, in fact, after the reflections, to call this type of reasoning paradoxical morality. But early in the French Revolution, at the time when his writing the reflections, he concluded many of those men of letters in France were induced by such, quote, paradoxes of eloquent writers, not just Rousseau, but, you know, he was clearly one of them, not only to limit them to speculation and entertainment, not only to use these paradoxes as opportunities for sort of um, uh, intellectual discussion or um, you know, entertaining talk in the salon and so on, but to apply them to political programs. They had in this way, you could say, adulterated metaphysics. They had contributed to Diogenes's, I say error, I mean it wasn't necessarily what Diogenes was particularly arguing in that uh, extract, but they had severed the relationship between nature and the artifices of nature. And Burke believed he foresaw the implications not only on the future of the revolution, but on the future of France and on the wider international community in this metaphysical adulteration. And that's we see that development starting really in the reflections and then moving on in his later writings on the French Revolution. Now if the French Revolution was spurred by this separation of nature from custom or the artifice of nature, it was also goaded on by the separation of nature itself from any divine or pre-political derivation, at least in the political sphere. In this sense, the attack by the revolutionary government on the church and on the church property was, in a sense, merely indicative of a much deeper malaise. Burke understood adherence to nature in the informal tendencies of family and the little platoon, as he famously refers to it, as indicative of the universal and timeless aspects of the human person, and therefore absolutely integrally related to the idea of man as a religious animal within, uh, within the political system and, and outside as well. Custom or tradition, however, reflects our temporal life in this world, subject to the vagaries of fortune, inheritance, culture, those factors that help direct our behavior to social interaction and health, but over which we have only limited, if any, real control. And in this situation, in the sort of division that, that I'm making for this argument between the sort of the eternal uh, living according as it were to natural instincts and living according to the artifices of nature, if you like, the history of nature as it develops through our customs and our traditions uh, and so on. In this situation, it's the state that keeps or should keep nature and custom in fine balance, reflecting in a more fruitful paradox our 
eternal and our temporal existence in community, that we, all individuals uh, in community, in society, have, as it were, a foot in the eternal and a foot in the temporal, a foot in nature, a foot in the artifice of nature. And the job of the state is to find a way and to nurture a way in which those two paradoxical aspects almost of our character can, can remain fruitfully uh, together. If I go back to uh, Cicero, uh, then uh, there's a very interesting uh, quotation again that comes from uh, on offices when Cicero, talking about wisdom, the greatest of virtues, describes it in this way. It is knowledge of things divine and human. And this embraces the sense of community between gods and men and the relationship between man and man. It's almost like a, almost like a kind of a trinity there, the, the relationship between man and God, the relationship between man and man, and also that the way in which those two relationships are sort of brought together in influencing the way in which man interacts with man. <clears throat> a sentimental or a rational triumph of nature over convention, over our inclinations to tradition, uh, is in Burke's mind the destruction of a truly free society. And you could also say that about in the other way, when people might emphasize convention or tradition over nature, a point that I'll mention a little bit further on. But of course, in a sense, the sentimental, the sort of Rousseau-esque uh, approach, uh, or the rational, the sort of Diogenes' approach, in a way, um, both bring victory to nature over um, the artifice of nature. Uh, and that can happen the other way around as well. But for the French Revolution, Burke is particularly concerned at this time in his life uh, with, with the former. Wherever Burke speaks about natural law, he is stressing that anything attached to our universal and timeless existence cannot be subject finally to an earthly sovereign or state. This is one of the reasons why, as I say, uh, emphasis, too much emphasis on stasis, on, uh, you know, tradition being, um, even if it seems to violate nature, it, it would be bad for, for, for Burke, uh, as far as Burke is concerned as well. Um, because our eternal relationship with nature is what, at some point, may lead us to reach out of the confines or the restrictions or the parameters of society and of government and of the state to a, to a higher um, source of, uh, of law and justice. Um, in reflections, I think we do see this um, concept being conveyed when Burke describes the appropriate perspective of the administrator or the governor as rising, or, or should rise, beyond, quote, the paltry pelf of the moment to a solid permanent existence in the permanent part of their nature and to a permanent fame and glory in the example they leave as a rich inheritance to the world end of quotes, so another kind of very Ciceronian um, uh, approach. This sense of permanence is nurtured in religious establishments, of course, for religion is, as Burke argues, the basis of civil society. But it inheres also, in some degree, um, 
of hereditary right, which is, again quoting Burke from the Reflections, neither unnatural nor unjust nor impolitic. And then also in the right of private property, for the strong struggle, another quotation, the strong struggle in every individual to preserve possession of what he has found to belong to him and to distinguish him is one of the securities against injustice and despotism implanted in our nature. It operates as an instinct to secure property and to preserve communities in a settled state. So you see, these features are all liberal in providing us, according to Burke, with a standard that transcends the purely political. And it is the instincts that incline us to each one of them, each of these sort of permanent aspects of society that Burke understands as prejudices. In his own political career, we see such prejudices driving his thoughts relating to imperial reform in Ireland and in India. Uh, in both Ireland, where Burke criticised the um, continuation of what were known as the popery laws, which uh, discriminated against Roman Catholics in matters of property rights, Burke was particularly concerned with, and also in matters of education and, of course, their religious, um, their, their freedom to, um, uh, to, to worship as they wished in open. All of these uh, aspects uh, are criticised by Burke in his writings on Ireland, where, of course, he originally came from before moving to uh, England in 1750. And they also come up again uh, in Burke's uh, writings on India, uh, where famously in the 17, later 1780s and 1790s, uh, Burke was involved in the impeachment of uh, Warren Hastings, a governor general uh, uh, in Bengal, uh, in, in India for uh, corruption and so on. Um, where, again, Burke emphasises both the particularities and the, and the diversity of cultural, religious, social environments within uh, India, but then also emphasises the common humanity, uh, the natural law concept again, by which imperial rulers uh, may be criticised and attacked for their policies uh, within the colonies. And also in their relationship with um, nominally independent or actually independent um, uh, states within uh, India itself. So what I'm suggesting or what I'm arguing here um, is that uh, these prejudices, though we have, you know, understandably in the modern world, a, a, a sense of the, how this uh, is, is something bad, something that needs to be combated. But here, I think we can understand the word prejudices as uh, emphasising um, and encouraging Burke in a number of um, movements to reform and um, re-energize and um, alter uh, imperial policy, British imperial policy uh, in, their, in their territories and in territories under their influence. The um, similar points explains Burke's understanding of re religious toleration. Um, you know, I, I, I see Burke very much as a, a, as a sort of a, really a latitudinarian, a, 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 a member of the Church of England, um, uh, who, who was 
had a very broad concept of the importance of uh, religious toleration um, in Britain in the later 18th century. Uh, we'll say that um, one must also note that um, around the time of the French Revolution, uh, his attitude to toleration seems to have tightened uh, and he held a concept um, of sincere religion. He talks about this concept of sincere religion um, that separates it from atheism and deism uh, and also certain, uh, he includes certain um, uh, sort of other religious groups and I've got a feeling that what he is looking at there again, going back to Cicero's concept of, um, uh, of uh, wisdom, the, d the definition of wisdom, is this relationship between God and man on man community, the sort of like the third aspect, if you like, of, um, uh, of that particular definition. And sincere religion would have to sort of promote um, that relationship almost like a, you know, a spirit um, uh, from God infusing uh, our relationships with other human beings. At the same time, we also owe obedience and respect to the way in which nature has molded us to social cohesion and support through custom convention, tradition, what Cicero maybe would have called the mos maiorum. In fact, in its closeness to order and stability, this obedience might be the more immediate um, pull, if you like, of the two. It's promoted through that famous contract uh, between generations that appears uh, in reflections, uh, that relationship between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. And through prejudice, as I've uh, suggested, and manners and chivalry, uh, the last being, in a sense, Burke's chosen way of referring to the role of the gentleman. And what does the gentleman do? He maintains just and equal rights with his fellow citizens and works for peaceful and honourable policies to prevail in the state. Well, I've tried to um, offer in the sort of um, emphasis on the relationship between what I've called nature and the artifice of nature some way of understanding terms that appear in the reflections, the law of nature, uh, prejudice, uh, chivalry, um, the emphasis upon uh, property rights that, 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 that may really um, re repel, I suppose, almost people from uh, receiving the messages of reflections as I think they deserve to be received. So I'm hoping that that may um, help uh, in, uh, should we say, increasing our understanding uh, of reflections uh, when we read it. There's a lot of Cicero here. Um, Burke, I believe, was strongly influenced by Cicero's writings, as you would e expect. Uh, any such person in the, uh, in the 18th century to be. Um, but I think we need to bear that in mind as we uh, understand uh, the language of reflections, not, of course, by 21st century standards. And in doing this, I think we also see the importance of, um, you know, the, the, this sense of humanity that resides outside the state and the way in which Burke tried to deal uh, with this particular aspect uh, of the human condition. Because I think therefore it also relates to uh, Burke the reformer. Um, Burke the, in a sense, it's a way of understanding how Burke the reformer 
uh, is closely linked to Burke, the anti-revolutionary, uh, which, as I said before, I don't think is quite the same as uh, counter-revolutionary. Uh, um, there's one final quotation that I would like to go back to the uh, notebook and sort of leave you with. Um, it's a very short one. It's, again, from the same section. Um, and it's almost like a, I wouldn't say a little cry of the heart, but um, Burke is, has been talking about custom, tradition. He's brought in the point about tradition. And then he ends up with, comes up with this uh, sentence, which I, I think is, really gets, in some ways, to the heart of Burke and what he's trying to do. Why should I desire, he writes, why should I desire to be more than man? I have too much reverence for our nature to wish myself divested even of the weak parts of it. Burke's reflections in many ways might seem to be a, an attempt to deal with the inevitable weaknesses, mystery, incomplete knowledge that human beings can garner. And his relationship of nature and the artifice of nature is a way of trying to deal with that situation uh, in as humane uh, and in as um, rational uh, way as possible.